Middle Path Radio, your number one online Islamic talk station. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, dear brothers and sisters. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya al-mursaleen. Nabina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. Today's talk is entitled The Story of Jerusalem, The Story of Baytul Maqdis. And uh, just to start off, let us reflect over the situation that we have today. The desperate and uh, depressing situation that we have today in Palestine didn't come about by itself. It is almost like one domino that was collapsed by another domino that came way before. And the idea here is that today is the result of many things that happened previously in history. In order to understand and appreciate where we are today, you need to know the history. If you don't know the history, you will never be able to understand what is happening. And more to the point, you will never be able to <coughs> deal with the, the problem properly. So the, the, the purpose of today's talk actually is not about the political situation in Palestine. That is something that, alhamdulillah, many people know about, are active <coughs> about. The purpose is about the spiritual connection that we should have to this place. What does it mean, spiritual connection? It means, what does this land, Baytul Maqdis, mean to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That is a question which we will try to answer today. Because if we educate ourselves about what this place means to Allah, then we are actually educating ourselves about what it should mean to us, isn't it? For we hold that Allah is the greatest. And whatever Allah holds to be great, we also hold to be great, true or not? But if we don't know what something means to Allah, then we could never really appreciate what it is in reality, is it? isn't it? So let us start by having a discussion. I will ask you, my brothers, tell me, what is it about this place that makes it spiritually, religiously significant and important? What has happened there? What may happen there? And besides all of this, anything else that you know that makes this place special, I would like you to share it with me. So let's start. What is it about this place that comes to your mind that says, you know what, this is something great, religiously speaking, because of this reason, because this happened or this will happen. Who can start us off? Why is this place called Jerusalem, <coughs> Beit al-Maqdis in Arabic, special religiously? Yes, Sakhi, at the back there. Very good. So this was the, the direction, the Qibla of the Muslims. Anyone know for how long? It was the Qibla for around 14 years. One and a half years or 17 to 18 months after the Prophet migrated from Mecca to Medina, they were praying towards this place. Like we are praying today towards Mecca, the Muslims are praying towards Jerusalem for this many years, yeah, almost 14 years. That's one reason why it's special. And you know, Subhanallah, there's a narration about Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala. He's one of the companions that lived longer than other companions. And so many tabi'een became tabi'een because they met Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala. And when many of the companions had passed away, one of the followers came to him and Anas described himself to this Muslim, this tabi'i, by saying, I am one who used to pray to both Qiblas. Meaning, I was a Muslim back then when he used to pray to in the direction of Jerusalem as well as towards Mecca, al mukarramah And so I have that honor. He felt, subhanAllah, that this is the best way to describe himself as one of those I used to pray to both Qiblas. Yeah? So this is one reason, just one reason why this place is special. What are the reasons, my brothers? Uh, yes. Rasulullah uh, very good. Barakallahu This is the location from where the Mi'raj took place. Al-Isra'i wal-Mi'raj. The Isra part is about the journey from Mecca al-Mukarramah, from the Kaaba to Masjid al-Aqsa. The second part of the journey is from Masjid al-Aqsa to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Yeah, so there's two journeys. Al-Isra, which means night journey, and Al-Mi'raj. Anyone know which surah in the Quran spoke about journey number one? Surah Al-Isra, yes, Surah Al-Isra. Yeah, Surah Al-Isra spoke about the first part. But which surah spoke about the second one? I expect you to know, Alim. <laughs> surah Al-Najm, yes. Surah Al-Najm spoke about the second part. The ascent. Yeah, Al-Mi'raj is literally the vehicle by which you ascend. So in Surah Al-Isra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Subhan al-ladhi asra bi'abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa al-ladhi barakna hawla. Yeah, Allah said, and glory. As in a way of saying, subhanAllah, to express the ajub, amazement. How amazing is it that Allah took his slave, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to, from, on a night journey from Masjid al-Haram, from al-Ka'bah, all the way to Jerusalem, Masjid al-Aqsa, in one night. A journey that would have taken at least a month in those times. Allah miraculously took him from that masjid to this masjid in one night. And Allah said, that place, barakna hawla, a place that has baraka, not in and of itself only, but the surrounding area too is mubarak because of it. And that teaches us something. The, the Masjid al-Aqsa itself is mubarak, is blessed. You know when something is, has barakah, it means it has something. The goodness is beyond your expectation. And also barakah is something that is goodness lingers on forever. Yeah, for a long time. But Allah said, the land around it is also blessed because it is surrounding this masjid. And so some of the scholars said, the, the area called Asham, which in modern day is Syria, Jordan, Lebanon and Palestine together, is all blessed because it surrounds Masjid Al-Aqsa. Imagine, <laughs> that vast land is all blessed because of this Masjid Al-Aqsa. And one of the reasons it is blessed is because the Prophet ﷺ ascended on the night journey upwards to the heavens from that location. That's number two reason. <coughs> what other reasons? Yes. Is it the second house of Allah? The second house of Allah? What do you mean by that? Well, I think the Kaaba came first. The Kaaba came the first? Masjid okay, so you're saying that the first masjid was? The Kaaba and second? <coughs> Al-Aqsa. Al Who knows about this? Is the, is the brother saying you agree with the brother? Yeah. The second masjid ever to be built was Al-Aqsa. Do you agree? Who agrees? The first? The first? No. The Difference of opinion amongst the scholars here. Huh? He's correct. Yes, yeah, subhanAllah. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, he asked the Prophet which was the first masjid ever to be built? I mean, what a question to ask. What does that teach us? It teaches us that the companions, they wanted to know which part of the earth is most beloved to Allah. That's what they wanted to know. So he asked which masjid was built first. And the Prophet said, the Kaaba. The Kaaba was the first one to be built. And then he said, what was in the second? He said, Masjid Al-Aqsa. The name Al-Aqsa literally means the far away, Ab'ad, the furthest. So the link is here that the Masjid Al-Haram and the second Masjid was the furthest Masjid away from that Masjid and it was Al-Aqsa. And then he asked, and how long in between two? The Prophet said, 40. 40 years. So some of the scholars like Ibn Hajar, they said, the first to build the Kaaba was Adam Alayhi salam. And either it was him or one of his children who built Masjid Al-Aqsa. So he said he sent his children about the earth and they came to Jerusalem. And there they established either the foundations of the masjid or the actual masjid, Masjid Al-Aqsa. And so it was the second masjid to be established. Okay. Very good. Any other reasons? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Sorry. So somebody hasn't. Just uh, get everyone. Yes. In Bayt al-Maqaddis? No, not Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam, uh, despite his longing to enter into Jerusalem, he was not able to because of his people. And we'll cover that, inshallah. What are the reasons, my brothers? <coughs> yes, yes. Um, will the Mahdi come back to Jerusalem? Imam Mahdi? Yes. And who else will come to this place? 
Isa alayhi salam. Yes, so <laughs> we just went from the beginning of time until Yawm al-Qiyamah. On Yawm al-Qiyamah, there's something going to happen which makes this place special as well. And that is the return of Isa alayhi salam. He will come down to this place, the Prophet told us in a hadith in Sayyid Bukhari and Muslim, that Isa alayhi salam will come down to Baytul Maqdis. And it is there that he will fight at Dajjal, the false messiah. And at Dajjal will try to enter inside Jerusalem and he will not be able to. And he will be killed outside Jerusalem. So imagine all of these amazing, great things that are going to happen towards the end of time are going to happen there. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Okay, well, I'm not, I wasn't sure of that. I don't know that. Anything different? Yes. Ahsant, yes. During the night journey, the Prophet led all of the Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Salah there as well. Which is another amazing thing. We'll come to that, inshallah, at the end. Okay, there's something else that we missed, and that is. Uh, Isa alayhi salam born there. Isa alayhi salam? Born there. Oh, mashallah. Very good. We missed this one. Uh, Isa alayhi salam was born in this place as well. Uh, born in this place. So, inshallah, we'll come to more as we go along. But this is just to get you to, to realize that. Hang on a minute. So much happened there. So much will happen there as well. This is, place is amazing. Okay. Tayyip. Now, one other thing what you missed is that the salah in this masjid is not like any ordinary salah, is it? It is multiplied. And here there is actually a difference of opinion which I came across. Different narrations. The Prophet ﷺ is asked, which, is, which masjid is the best masjid? And he said, it is Masjid Al-Haram. And then he was asked about what follows after that. Sorry, I need... Okay, going back to the narration. Again, this is the narration of Abu Dhar Al-Ghifari. He was asking the Prophet ﷺ, which masjid is the best after Al-Ka'bah? It is the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. And then he spoke about Masjid Al-Aqsa. And he also mentioned it in a number of ahadith, the multiply, the, the amount that the salah will be multiplied. In Masjid Al-Haram, it is how much? 100,000 times. And in the Prophet of Masjid, it is? 50. And in Masjid Al-Aqsa, here there are two narrations. In fact, there are more than two. But Ibn Taymiyyah mentions the strongest two. He said the first narration is the narration that the salah is equal to 250 times. And in another narration, it is 500 times. So, inshallah, if you were to go, if you were to think about going now to Jerusalem, and I urge you all to make an intention to, to go there, to visit this amazing place. And if you stay there for just seven days, you would pray 35 salah there. And those 35 salah will be equal to how many? Any accountants here? How many? 35 salah is equal to times 500, 17,500. And 17,500 salah is, is equal to nine and a half years of salah. How much? Nine and a half years of salah. So if you <laughs> went on a journey for seven days, prayed all your salah in Masjid Al-Aqsa, you would, it would be as if you worship Allah for nine and a half years. Imagine. And this is not adding on any voluntary praise. Just the, the fara'id. Ta'ib. So this is another reason why it is special. Because the salah is more valuable in the eyes of Allah than any other place. Now, the beginning. Where does it all begin? We mentioned this hadith already of Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. The Prophet is telling us here that the second masjid to be built after only 40 years of the Kaaba was Masjid al-Aqsa. And so that is where it begins, in the time of Adam alayhi salam. And from that time, it has been special to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who was the one who rebuilt the Masjid al-Aqsa as we know it today? This is something of an agreement amongst the scholars that the masjid, in terms of its size, Okay, and it's a rectangular size. I'll show you the picture here. You can see it here. The red line represents the rectangular size of Masjid Al-Aqsa, which is said to be the size that Sulaiman alayhi salam built it. Uh, Ibn Hazr al-Asqalani rahimahullah said, in fact, it was his father. Who was the father of Sulaiman? Dawood alayhi salam. Very good. He began the commission to build this masjid or rebuild it in a much bigger size. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired him that rather it would be your son Sulaiman who will come 
to build it. Okay? And so the red rectangular size represents the size of which Sulaiman built Masjid al Aqsa. And subhanAllah, after he built it, he stood in the middle. And the middle is where you see the dome of the rock. You know the golden dome? That was not there during the time of Sulaiman and it was not there during the time of the Prophet. Rather, it was built there 72 years after the Hijrah of the Prophet by Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. He stood there, which is the highest point in Jerusalem. And he made a dua to Allah. And he asked Allah for three things. Number one, Allah, give me a kingdom, the likes of which will be inappropriate for anyone after me to have it. He asked Allah for a kingdom which would be so magnificent, no one after him could ever rival it. The second dua, Allah, give me judgment that coincides with your judgment. When I judge in a matter, let me strike the mark in accordance with how you deem it to be correct. And the third dua is, O oh Allah, whoever comes here only intending to pray salah, that he leaves with all his sins forgiven. And the Prophet ﷺ, who is narrating what Sulaiman said, he said, and I ask Allah to accept his dua. And that is why, subhanAllah, it is reported that Ibn Umar, who was very particular about following the Sunnah of the Prophet he would travel from Medina to Masjid al-Aqsa just to pray two rak'ah and he wouldn't even drink water and he would return back home in order to be under this dua that I came all the way here just to pray two rak'ah like Sulaiman made a dua and I don't even drink the water here to show Allah I am so sincere in what I want SubhanAllah Imagine this is the virtue of this place so one or two things about the, the Masjid Al-Aqsa. There's a difference between a Musalla and a Masjid. The Musalla is like the place, where, the place where people get together to pray the Salah. However, the Masjid in this context is much bigger than the place that people pray the Salah. Now, what does that mean? At the bottom left hand side of the picture, within the rectangular circle, or within the rectangular red lines, you have Masjid al-Aqsa, which is called Masjid al-Aqsa, which is the Musalla, i.e. the place where people pray. The building has been established there and that is where they pray the Salah. In the middle you have the Dome of the Rock. Yeah. This is not a Masjid per se, but rather it is inside the Masjid area. So the whole rectangular shape and place is Masjid al-Aqsa. Anywhere inside that constitutes Masjid al-Aqsa. Okay? But the place, the place that people pray is the Musalla, which is built at the very beginning of it. Okay? And this, they said, goes back to the time of Umar al-Khattab. Umar al-Khattab was the one who opened Jerusalem. Yeah? This is only 16 years yeah, after the Hijrah of the Prophet Umar al-Khattab arrives at Jerusalem. Imagine. And the Prophet initiated the conquest of Jerusalem during his life through which battle? Anyone know? Which battle did he commission which would lead to the conquest of Jerusalem? Anyone know which battle? Mu'atan? There's another one after that. Tabuk. Tabuk. Ahsan, very good. Tabuk was to go and fight the Byzantine Empire, which was the uh, eastern <coughs> province of the Roman Empire. And that would lead to the conquest of Jerusalem. So you can imagine, Prophet had his eyes on Aqsa during his life when he was still in Mecca and Medina. Okay? So it was Umar al-Khattab who arrives there as the conqueror of this place. And they didn't fight him, rather they, they welcomed him. And that is something maybe we'll speak about another time. When he came, he didn't want to build the Musalla in the middle. You know why? Because in the middle, that was the number one reason was that was the direction of the Qibla for the Muslims as well as the Jews. But by that time, the Qibla was no longer Jerusalem, it was Mecca. So he didn't want to build the Musalla at a place where people would pray in as if they are still praying towards the abrogated uh, Qibla. The second reason was is because the Jews still prayed towards this direction or rather they would pray in that location because they deemed that to be sacred for other reasons. 
So in order to avoid this, he built the musalla away from that. Okay. So but the actual capacity of this whole place, they said, is half a million. Half a million people can pray inside Masjid Al-Aqsa, according to this rectangular shape. This is what some people have said. Yes, Habibi. Um, a couple of questions. Is, where's the waiting wall? Okay, so... That's the musalla, yes. Bottom left, yes. See, that's what, that's, that's what I mentioned. That there's no purpose to it. As in, there's no religious purpose to it. But there is historical significance to it. Maybe we'll come to that, inshallah. Yeah, so in terms of where is it, it's in the middle of the masjid. And the, the wailing wall, this is on the left. Yeah. So the Qibla is exactly So this is, see, see the Dome of the Rock? See, that's the middle of Masjid Al-Aqsa, so it makes sense, like, that would, be the, that would be the focal point of the Qibla, do you see? Jews want to move from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Yeah, there's many reasons, inshallah. And uh, like I said, I don't want to make it into a political, that's, this is more the spiritual side, inshallah. Uh, Allah Alam. Okay, so let's move on. What is the ruling on visiting this place? What do you think? After you've heard all of this, if someone would say to you, what is the ruling Islamically on visiting Masjid Al-Aqsa? What do you think? Is it wajib? Is it recommended? Is it permissible? Which one? What do you think? Yes. Recommended. Very good, mashallah. It is mustahab. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, there is a consensus amongst the scholars. And to be honest, I was quite surprised. He said, there is an agreement amongst all scholars that it is mustahab, recommended religiously to visit this place. You know what that means? Just like you and I like to go and visit uh, Mecca and Medina for Umrah in the same vein should we like to go and visit Masjid Al-Aqsa now how many of us have that yearning really and truly yeah this is a lesson for us Tayyip, moving on other prophets we have Ibrahim alayhi salam and his nephew Lut alayhi salam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells in the Quran وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ وَلُوطًا إِلَى الْأَرْضِ الَّتِي بَارَكْنَا فِيهَا لِلْعَالَمِينَ Surah Al-Anbiya verse number 77 Allah says and we rescued and delivered Ibrahim and Lut to this place which Allah again refers to as being blessed. So Ibrahim as well as Lut, they came and they lived in Palestine, in Jerusalem. And in fact, Ibrahim actually passed away in Jerusalem. And his grave, again Ibn Kathir says, by agreement of all the scholars, is in Palestine. As well as his son, Ishaq yeah. and there is this picture here this is the picture of Masjid al-Khalil Masjid al-Khalil again was not built in the time of the Prophet nor was it built by the companions rather this was first built as a church by the Christians and then when the Muslims came after the time of Salah al-Din Ayyubi he is the one uh, sorry the Muslims during that time converted this church into a masjid and then I don't know whether it was the Christians or the Muslims, they built some tombs inside and supposedly they said that is where Ibrahim and some of his family are buried. However, Ibn Kathir said, though there is agreement that Ibrahim passed away and his qabr is in this area of Hebron, the exact location is unknown. Yeah, the exact location is unknown. So, subhanAllah, in this blessed land is the body of our father Ibrahim Amazing. Yeah, this is blessed. Yeah. Then you have uh, Ya'qub alayhi salam. Ya'qub alayhi salam, as you know from the story of Yusuf, father of Yusuf is Ya'qub. Where did they live initially? They lived in Palestine. This is where they lived. And then they migrated because of Yusuf alayhi salam to Egypt. Now Ya'qub, his name, or well, he was referred to as Israel. And the followers of Ya'qub alayhi salam were known as Bani Israel, yes, yeah, Bani Israel. Now, they were in Egypt now because that's where Yaqub was. His children and his children's children, they became Bani Israel. They were in Egypt until when? When did they leave Egypt? The time of Musa, yes, and the time of Musa, Musa, another prophet of Allah is sent to them, Bani Israel, and they are they're enslaved to Fir'aun, yes. I have a question. 
you know, like in the time of the Prophet Ibrahim, <coughs> yes. um, uh, was it all Palestine or was it, was it Israel? Ah, yes, good question. The brother's asking in the time of Ibrahim, was it Palestine and was there Israel as well? You see, all these borders and the names, even, they're non existent until modern times. The area was just known as Jerusalem. Yeah, and it changed hands between Muslims and non Muslims and uh, idol worshippers and so on and so forth so many times. Yeah, so this is, this is what happened. So in time of Ibrahim, it was Jerusalem, until now it's Jerusalem. And the idea of Palestine and Israel that came like in our time. Yeah. Okay. So then you have Musa alayhi salam, and he rescues Bani Israel from the, the brutal regime of Fir'aun. After liberating them from slavery, he brings them to this blessed place, Jerusalem. And they are told by Musa, let us enter inside. We need to conquer this place. What did the people say? They said, no, inside this place, there are some scary people. This is what they said. Inside, there's some scary people. We're not going to go inside. How, what a response, subhanAllah, from these people to their prophet. After he's just split the sea for them, they're saying to him, we're not going to listen to you. We're going to stay right here. We're going to stay right here, Musa. You go Astaghfirullah with your Rabb to go fight them. Can you imagine? And as a punishment, they were then barred from this holy place for how many years? 40 years. Made to wander around. Yeah, made to wander around in the deserts. Who had to suffer alongside them? Musa alayhi salam. He had to suffer with them. Subhanallah. And Musa alayhi salam, Ibn Kathir wrote in Al-Bidai wa Niha, he longed for Jerusalem so much that once he went to a, mount, a mountain in Jordan, which from where, I think this is called Mount Nebo, you can see into Jerusalem. And there he made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said in this dua, Rabbi adinini ila al-ard al-muqaddasa ramiyatan bi hajr. He said, O oh my master, allow me to draw close enough to this blessed place until I'm just a stone throw away from it. I know that I cannot enter, but just let me get that close to it. That I'm just this much away from it. SubhanAllah. And the Prophet ﷺ, after narrating this, he said, if I was there in Jerusalem, I could show you where he's buried. Somewhere outside, under a red sand dune. SubhanAllah. So Allah subhanAllah accepted his dua. He passed away just literally outside of Jerusalem. Yeah, this is Musa alayhi then you have Yusha. Yusha became a prophet after Musa alayhi In fact, Yusha was the young apprentice during which story? Musa goes to see who? Khidr. Very good. And who is the Fatah who comes, goes along with him? Yusha. So Yusha is like the apprentice of Musa. Okay, Musa alayhi passed away. Allah makes him a prophet. It was Yusha that then took Bani Israel to go and conquer Jerusalem. And here, Amazing story, the people fought with Yusha Islam to enter into Jerusalem. They fought alongside him. However, keeping in line with the Jewish tradition of not fighting on Saturday, Yom Sabbath, when they entered, when they were about to enter into Jerusalem, the time for Maghrib was coming and it was Saturday was going to start. And that would mean they have to stop the fighting. Here in Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet mentions the dua Yusha made to Allah and he said, looking at the sun, he said, Innaki ma'murun wa ana ma'mur. He said to the son, You are just the object of Allah's command as well as me being the object of Allah's command. Then he made dua to Allah, Oh Allah, hold it back. Hold it back. And Allah answered his dua. And in the next few hours, Jerusalem was conquered by Yusha. And so they entered into Jerusalem. Tayyib. So now Bani Israel are inside. Then you have Dawood and as you mentioned Dawood he initiated the conquest of or uh, the, the building rather of the Masjid Al-Aqsa but it was his son Suleiman who, who completed that building. One of the interesting things about Dawood is that he was given a very beautiful voice, yeah, mesmerizing and Ibn Kathir rahimahullah, he said that when Dawood would begin to recite az zabur the religious scripture the birds in the sky would stop in mid-flight and turn back to listen to him recite. 
Ya jibalu awibi ma'ahu wa tayr. Allah says in the Quran, O mountains, chime the dhikr of Allah with him as well as the birds. Imagine the birds and the mountains chiming the dhikr of Allah with this man Dawood alayhi salam. It was his son Suleiman who would become a great king as well as a prophet. And he is the one who built Masjid al-Aqsa. طيب. Then you have three notable people. Zakaria alayhi salam and his son is Yahya alayhi salam. And then you have Maryam alayhi salam who gives birth to Isa alayhi salam. All of these figures are coming at the same time. All of them are living where? In Jerusalem. All of them. So Zakaria alayhi salam, he makes a dua to Allah. Inni khiftul mawaliya min warai. He makes a dua to Allah. Now, you know, when I first read this dua, I thought to myself, subhanAllah, he's asking for a son. And I thought of it in a worldly sense. You know, people, they can't have children. They ask Allah, please allow us to have a child. However, was he asking because of a worldly reason, because he wanted a child, he wanted the happiness of a child? No. He says, Inni khiftul mawaliya min warai. He says, I fear that my relatives that I'm going to leave behind, they are not going to be good enough to lead the people and to take care of Masjid al-Aqsa. Yeah. That is why he wanted a son in order to raise him to be righteous so he could take care of that place. That was the reason. And so Allah gifted him Yahya. Even though Zakaria was so old and his wife was Aqir, she was unable to, she was unable to give birth. Tayyib. Yahya comes and then you have Maryam. And Maryam, she gives birth to Isa alayhi salam. And Isa alayhi salam is there in Jerusalem and he used to give khutbah in Masjid al-Aqsa. Can you imagine? That place, Isa alayhi salam used to call the people to Allah in Masjid al-Aqsa. But Bani Israel rejected him and they called upon the Romans who were in charge of Jerusalem at that time to, to take him out. And so the supposed crucifixion of Isa alayhi salam, though we do not believe in it, took place there. And that is why it became a holy place for the Christians. Yeah, that's why it became a holy place. And now in the Easter holidays, there will be many Christians going to Palestine in order to commemorate what they commemorate according to their religious beliefs. Now, two last slides here. Something interesting here, broadening out from the religious narrative to a more historical narrative. Jerusalem has passed through the hands of so many different empires and civilizations. So you have the Assyrians and the Assyrians, they, from the ruins of the Assyrians came the Babylonians. Okay, this is going back 586 years before Isa alayhi salam. Back then, something terrible happened. And that was one of the kings from the Babylonians, name was Nebuchadnezzar, Bukhta Nasr in, in Arabic. He conquered Jerusalem and Bani Israel were made to suffer. In fact, he exiled 40,000 of the Jews from Jerusalem and he demolished Masjid al-Aqsa, demolished it totally. Tayyib. So Masjid al-Aqsa was destroyed by this king Bukhta Nasr from the Babylonians. And one of the interesting things, and this is by according to non-Muslim academics and historians, that the Bani Israel before that time, before they got conquered and Masjid al-Aqsa was destroyed, they became very ir irreligious. They became far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until it is said that they started worshipping idols and they placed idols inside Masjid al-Aqsa. Can you imagine? Inside Masjid al-Aqsa, they placed idols and there was a place uh, called the Valley of Hinnom. Valley of Hinnom is still there till today. They used to do sacrilegious things there. Of them was they used to have child sacrifice, get a baby and slaughter. And also of them is that they used to, uh, they used to have uh, and it's a very evil type of torturing that used to happen there, so on and so forth. And this is basically just before the tragedy of Jerusalem and for us this is a clear sign that when people go far away from Allah and disobey him Allah punishes them yeah punishes them in order that they turn back to him and subhanallah this is what happened to Ben Israel the second time this happened to them and Masjid al-Aqsa was destroyed because it was rebuilt after that is 60 years after Isa alayhi salam so imagine Isa alayhi salam was rejected by Ben Israel 
60 years after you have this uh, general called General Titus from the Romans. Now the Jews they tried to rebel against the Roman control of Jerusalem and they sent General Titus to come and quash this uh, rebellion and when he came he laid a siege for four months and the Jews that tried to flee he would get them and he would crucify them yeah, until they gave up and when he entered he slaughtered them and what did he do? He tried to eradicate Judaism and so he destroyed Masjid Al-Aqsa once again once again Masjid Al-Aqsa was destroyed can you imagine? I mean so much has happened in this place yeah, over the course of history and so little do we know the last thing we would like to speak about is Al-Isra'i Wal-Mi'raj yeah, this amazing gift that was given to the Prophet ﷺ in the 10th year after prophecy known as the year of sorrow Allah blessed him with this gift where he went to Masjid Al-Aqsa and there, from there he went to Al-Isra'i he went to the heavens one of the amazing things that connects us to the Masjid and this, this story is that when the person came to Masjid Al-Aqsa on Buraq this creature which he described to be white as well as a size that is between a mule and a horse he said when he came there he tied it to a post and this hadith in say Bukhari which other prophets also tied him to as if to say that many other prophets have come here riding Buraq <coughs> just like I have and they would tie him to a particular post and some said that post is on the wailing wall yeah this is what they say Wallahu alam. and then he said I went into Masjid Al-Aqsa and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Masjid Al-Aqsa in the form that it was before for the Prophet and so he saw it in all of its glory and in one narration he prayed two rak'ah when he turns around he sees before him all the Prophets of Allah standing there so that how many Prophets is that? that is 124,000 Prophets of them 313 messengers and he says I saw Musa alayhi salam and he was standing there, he was tall and he was muscular and he was of a brownish color and then I saw Isa salam, and he was a man who was not that tall and his hair was glistening like with water and they were both praying and then I saw Ibrahim salam, and no one looks like him more than myself he described Ibrahim to look like himself and he said they were all praying and this is an amazing lesson. Imagine my brothers and sisters. The person sees them and what are they doing? Praying. They are praying. They have passed away. But even after they have passed away, they are still praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which shows us the significance of salah in the eyes of Allah. Even the prophets, they knew how much it meant to Allah. Even after we die, what does Allah love for us to pray? Let us pray. And so it is said that they lined up in one row one row all of the prophets lined up in one row and he was asked to lead them in the salah and the leading of the prophets in salah points towards not just the fact that he's the leader of all prophets but he is the leader of all people from both the east and the west because these prophets they lived in different places as the prophet he lived in arabia but when he led them, it showed that this man, Muhammad Sallallahu is the leader of all people from East and West. Taib, and it is from here, it is said that from the Dome of the Rock, yeah, this is a picture actually of inside the Dome of the Rock here. This part here, the most elevated place in Jerusalem, where you have the Dome of the Rock, it is said that from here, Jibreel Salam took Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam up on an ascension to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he went through the heavens one by one so if that is true then this subhanallah is the actual place where there was a journey that went from this dunya into the next world yeah so just imagine and you know, there's so many things about this place which are truly amazing and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to to make us feel a yearning towards this place that we make an intention that Allah allows us to pray at least two rak'ah before we die in this masjid, Masjid Al-Aqsa. And we also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to bring back the day of glory that this place once enjoyed and to restore it in its proper place. Ameen Ya Rabbil Alameen.